everyone. Uh, thanks to Peter for a great talk as well. Uh, can everyone hear me? Is that good? Yeah, okay. yeah you're good, man. Okay, cool. Excellent. Um, all right, so we're going to try to keep it a bit uh, a bit light for this, and maybe like get down a little bit from the intellectual heights that we uh, fortunately reached with Peter, and just basically like talk about what we can do in general with generative models today in deep learning, um, and what we can do with the space bar as well. Okay, cool. So first, I'll give you a background, then we'll talk about a little bit because this is a TensorFlow meetup, obviously. So what's new in TensorFlow 2.0? And effectively, TensorFlow 2.0 was just pretty much release the TensorFlow Developer Summit that is going on pretty much as we speak. And it's in alpha version right now. So we need to go actually like very, very high level. And also it will echo what we saw about TensorFlow Hub in the first talk, uh, about the changes that are occurring in, in TensorFlow 2 versus TensorFlow 1 and how exciting it is and how it can help you build your deep learning models. Then I'll talk about dual use because, uh, you know, like every year there's this Apple keynote and someone who's Unfortunately, not Steve Jobs anymore is coming in and says this changes everything. It's the iPhone 12. And uh, actually, well, this does change everything. The fact that generative models are now reaching a level where we're past the uncanny valley and we can actually generate some content that is gripping and for all intents and purposes virtually indistinguishable from what a human could be able to create. That, that does change things quite a lot. And finally, if we do have some time, we'll uh, go on to engine perspectives uh, on this work. All right, cool. So background, uh, everything old is new again, as Peter said. Basically, neural networks, they're, they're not from yesterday. As a matter of fact, they come from 1970s. Uh, in master's thesis by a guy called Dean Einmar, who basically derived backpropagation in neural networks. You might argue that actually backpropagation is even older than that. However, and you know, I'm going to make some enemies in the room, but I think that modern deep learning is actually around four years old. And I would date roughly modern deep learning at the advent of two techniques, which are basically batch normalization and residual networks. And if I had to take a very, very rough analogy, and there's absolutely no equation in, that's in those slides, so if I had to take a very rough analogy that deep learning is like building a sandwich pile with you know, like stacks of basically matrix multiplications or convolutions and then nonlinearities, then you really want to build the deepest sandwich possible because that's a more expressive sandwich. And in order to build a sandwich that does not collapse, you need these stabilizers that are basically batch normalization and residual networks. And these are very recent inventions as, as far as like 2016, basically. Um, so this is effectively like the, the kind of like deep sandwich pile that we're talking about. This is just to show a scary graph, but the reality is all the blocks are basically the same. We don't have a deep network nowadays. We basically generally have some very homogeneous architectures so we can focus on uh, basically training them well and making them stable. And so why, why does it work now? Like if, if people had these ideas in the 70s, in the 80s, you know, as, as a matter of fact, a lot of physicists were out talking and thinking about these things uh, and linking statistics and physics uh, in the 80s to for neural network theory. Why does it work now? Well, simply for two reasons. First, we have tons of data. We have the internet. We all take pictures with our phones constantly. Exabytes are being produced daily. But also, we're in high dimension. And that's a new thing. Like, we probably all have done stuff like linear regressions when we're undergrads, and you know, you write a 3 3 matrix, and that's awesome. But little known is the fact that very different things happen mathematically when you start being in 4,000 or 5,000 dimensions. It's effectively phase transitions going on there. I think that phase transition is once and for all, and it's not going to be easy. Like, I don't want to be the hype killer, but when you see all these people telling you, well, you know, like this, there's these business applications, I say, yes, but. Um, it's going to be possible to actually, you know, scale down in terms of basically increasing sample efficiency for deep learning models, but you still need high dimensional data, and that's not necessarily something you get in business applications. So something to think about. Having said that, we do have GPUs, we do have fiber broadband, we do have handheld cameras, and we do have crazy software like TensorFlow to help us solve any kind of optimization problem. So that's why it's working now. So there's been many big breakthroughs. I'm not going to go through a, a history of it. You know, I'm not going to do a nostalgia trip. I can probably uh, share these slides later on. I think really like the advent of the key principles we're going to see today is basically 2014. So in five years, we've seen crazy, crazy progress in deep learning. So uh, first formulations of GANs and first formulations of VAEs are effectively in their modern shape, a 2014 story. Then 2015, like I've said, we've actually began being able to train these models, residual networks, batch normalization, even the Adam optimizer that basically trains your model faster. Uh, all of these things, they're kind of modern methods. If we had an oven in 2014, we invented the microwave in 2016. 
uh, Keras and TensorFlow, of course, 2016, more of the same with wide ResNets. Um, again, I'll probably be sharing all that stuff. Um, and advanced GANs starting from 2017 on. Uh, TensorFlow distributions and uh, some of that as well uh, last couple of years. Okay, so now that we've and again, I'm scrolling extremely fast on this because uh, basically there's too many to count and it's only a fraction of all the amazing papers that are getting out on archive on a regular basis. Um, what can we, what sticks out in all of this is, like Peter said, probably this won't get us, this won't get us to artificial general intelligence because this has nothing to do with the brain. We're talking about doing matrix multiplications, just loads of them. But one thing that is extremely powerful and, and and predictable is the fact that we managed to create content just through doing these matrix multiplications. Okay, so the success story that I want to tell you today is the success story of generative models. So the idea of generative models is you have a data set, can be images of cats for all that matters, and you say, okay, that basically implies a probability distribution, and I want to be able to sample from that probability distribution, right? So I want to be able to replicate an image, I want to be able to create a new image that looks like one of those cats, Ideally, I want to be able to create some factors or to understand some disentanglement factors and some latent representations, what's going on in my data set, right? Do the cats have two eyes? Do they have whiskers? And so on and so forth. So first, um, two approaches have been derived to do that because it's obviously a hard problem. So one approach was derived by Ian Goodfellow in 2014. It's called Generative Adversarial Network. Both approaches share this thing in common that they come from a very simple principle in life if at first you don't succeed, then try again twice, right? So basically, we couldn't derive a big neural network to generate some stuff because it was too complicated. So we decided to use two, two neural networks. In the case of GANs, a generator and a discriminator. The generator gives its name to the generative part of the process, and it generates something that looks like noise originally. The discriminator is like the judge on Britain's Got Talent. It says yes or no, and it buzzes, like, does it look like a cat? No, it doesn't. I can compare it to the data set, right? And basically, these two networks are playing an adversarial game. The generator is trying to counterfeit the data, and the discriminator is trying to judge whether it's, it's seeing a fake or not, right? So they are playing this game iteratively. Those of you who know game theory can see where it's going. Basically, like, there's a Nash equilibrium, and all of this stuff converges to a beautiful set. Well, the generator generates stuff that is completely indistinguishable from the data set, and the discriminator is permanently fooled and outputs one half as a probability of seeing a fake all the time. So those are GANs, and this was a beautiful uh, idea in theory for a long time, uh, a long time being a year. Um, and then independently, the Bayesian crowd derived something called VAEs, or variational autoencoders, which is basically a similar idea that you have two networks, and one is going to be called an encoder, and going to try to create a lower dimensional representation of your data, right? And the decoder is going to try to expand that code into basically replicating the data. So you pass your data through a bottleneck. Roughly speaking, imagine two bottles, put them together, and basically one of them is the encoder, the other one is the decoder. And these are two neural networks, and they also form a kind of generative model. This is obviously very high level. I just wanted to highlight these ideas. Don't worry, there's no math in any of this. Uh, I put my math course on a separate website. The purpose of this talk was not to tout it, so I'll give you the link at the end of the talk if you're interested. This is just these fundamental concepts of generative models with neural networks. So in 2015, we could do this, which was either extremely impressive if you're a mathematician or if you're more interested in real-world applications, not so much. Right? So we could basically generate some kind of set of uh, the 10 digits and map them in a two-dimensional plane and that was basically what's called a VAE embedding of the MNIST digit data set. And yeah, sure, I mean, you can try this at home. It's, it's beautiful, but it doesn't really get you anywhere as far as, you know, like real content generation is, is concerned. And the reason for that is those methods were numerically unstable, fundamentally. In 2016, uh, this is an image taken from uh, the awesome works of Tom White, who is a lecturer at the University of New Zealand. Uh, in 2016, we began being able to do this, so basically encoding and decoding faces. And what we did when we encoded faces is we started looking at the encoding of a face that smiles, the encoding of a face that does not smile, take a look at the differences, derive a smile vector, and then basically say, okay, like maybe I can make my, fa my face smile, maybe I can 
you know, like add some sunglasses to it. Maybe I can translate all these properties in the encoded latent space and, and I can see what happens, right? So you started being able to see a little bit like structure happen in, in data sets of uh, face pictures. In 2017, we could do this. And this was a huge splash when it came up. So it's very, very known paper from NVIDIA, which is called Progressive Growing uh, of GANs for Stability. And uh, I did not mention before, because it's a technical problem for engineers and mathematicians, but GANs in their original formulations were unstable. So people realized that, and for a couple of years tried to fix them. There was an onslaught of about 2,000 papers. It's pretty hard when you're a researcher just to keep up with that. You're like, oh, I woke up, okay, how many papers do I have to read today? Um, but you only had to read this one to realize that basically uh, the solution was very simple. If you're trying to build a pile of sand, then you start with the widest, right? And you start with the most stable part. This is what these guys are, are doing. Basically, again, they split the problem in several pieces and they say, maybe it's not so hard to generate images that are two times two. If I want to start with generating Instagram pictures with megapixels, this is very, very hard. But if I want to try generating images that look like an Atari video game four by four, then this is actually a lot simpler. Then I expand it to eight by eight. Then I take that starting point, I expand it to 16 times 16. Pretty soon I have a pyramid of images. And in the end, I get this, which is high resolution. And it does look quite cool. Right? Um, and these people don't exist. <laughs> like, again, it's pretty, pretty surprising, right? And then now, basically, the same, the same people have done it again. Like at the end of last year, just like Clockwork and Santa in December, that paper came up. And uh, Tiro Karas and uh, the usual suspects at NVIDIA basically improved on their previous work. And now we are able, effectively, from a data set of uh, megapixel images, uh, you train that, that model on that data set for about a month. You generate a lot of electricity and a lot of heat in, in the process, then you can generate these people who again do not exist. Right? So we effectively broke the barrier, I would argue, like uh, at least I am fooled. So I would argue we broke the barrier of photorealism uh, basically sometime last year. Right? As far as faces are concerned. Also, other things that are interesting in this first, there were not that many faces used um, to generate this. So, contrary to maybe you know, like what you would think. Uh, I think the actual data set was about 60 or 70,000 faces. So nothing too crazy. And I would actually argue that if you ask me to do this, I can probably find ways to get it down to 10,000. I mean, this not me. It's Taco Cohen from University of Amsterdam who's got papers on how to do this, if you're interested. Um, so it, it's not that much data. It's not, it's not a billion of pictures. It's actually more like 10,000. Okay? Um, so we're going to hold that thought for a second. And I'm going to come back to generative models. Now what I want to do, because again, TensorFlow is awesome and it's the London TensorFlow meetup, what I want to do is to highlight some key changes that have made implementing those models a lot easier in TensorFlow 2.0. And then we go back to generative models. So hold the thought for a second. Okay, I'm going to show you some code. This is, this is very naughty. The general layout of TF 2.0, the idea is basically TensorFlow was already awesome, but it was a bit heavy. Right? It was a bit heavy to use. There was a lot of boilerplates. So the idea with TF2 is to introduce two changes. First, make it more Pythonic. Okay, so like generally remove the boilerplate and try to use something that is a, um, a philosophy that is more like non-binary. Right? And I'll get to that in a sec. Um, and second, make debugging easier as well. And to make debugging easier, the thing is, TensorFlow was built in times when you needed to have a static computation graph. Right? Why did you need a static computation graph? For those of you who are old enough to remember Viano, Basically, the GPUs could not handle your models, so they had to be pre-compiled in order to run relatively fast. So, you know, like, you created a model in Tiano, you pressed F5, you waited to make a coffee or two, and then your model still hadn't run, because it was compiling, right? So TensorFlow kind of, like, was built on a similar foundation, uh, rapidly took over, but then people realized this is, this is messy, because when you want to debug your model, you have to break down the graph, right? So you have to, like, take the graph, convert it back to NumPy, it's a disaster. Um, and TensorFlow 2 gets away from that paradigm completely and basically builds the graph dynamically if you want it to. And it's called eager execution, so dynamic graphing that I've put here. Right? So there's this decorator called WIPTF gradient tape, and the gradient tape basically effectively takes a gradient operation for everything you do later on, which is great if you're a scientist because you don't ever need to take derivatives ever again. Right? So um, 
This is actually pretty easy. And they've, they've also made the uh, loading of data sets just a lot easier. So if you look at this tf of keras of data sets of mnist, it looks complicated, but really it's just loading mnist and it takes like, two lines. And it used to be a lot more, lo lot more involved than this. So if you load your data set using this basically syntax, and if you load your model, your pre-trained model using TF Hub, you can have a model running in three lines, which you know, is quite remarkable given how verbose TensorFlow used to be. Um, so that's one of the changes that's been made. The second change that's been made, um, I don't know if I have the right to say PyTorch, but yeah, there I've said it, is basically object-oriented uh, declaration of layers. So again, it used to be that layers were declared in a more functional kind of type. Uh, now we actually can also use basically this object abstraction. It's cleaner for a few reasons. If you have very, very heavy models, then you can put a lot of the, the dirty work. Basically, you just put it under the bed, uh, under the carpet, into this constructor class, which is called like, this, this init keyword. And uh, it makes everything a lot cleaner. So you can, uh, you can separate the code a lot earlier, easier. Like say MLP equals MLP. So you instantiate your multi layer of perceptron, and that's very, very fast. And that's also a lot cleaner and a lot more Pythonic. If you still like the, fun the, the old way of doing things, you can still do it with the functional API, which is basically just using functions instead of using objects. So that's directly taken from Keras, which used to be this language for non-researchers, but actually that's, that, that's a big boost for productivity. Uh, and I would argue that's something that you want to use for models that are actually already existent. So if you're not a researcher, if you're not deriving a new model, if you just want to train a model that already exists or is pre-existent, for instance, if I wanted to code a VAE, variational autoencoder, all of this pretty much almost reads like English with extra brackets and dots. Um, you know, like you, you define original inputs, you define X, you define the mean of X, the log variance of X, and then you define an encoder, and the encoder is just a model. Same thing for the decoder and the loss function. You can pretty much translate research papers like this, and it's very, very compact. Right? This model is effectively a 10-page paper in one page of code. So the functional API, if you haven't tried it, uh, you know, test it, and I can guarantee you will like it. Cool. So these are things that, all in all, enable you to generate, to, you know, create a generative model a lot faster. Wow, OK, five minutes, good. I have to speed up even more. <laughs> Excellent. So going back to generative models, why, why do we even care about generative models, besides the fact that we have pretty faces, right? First, we can create unreal people. I don't want to say fake people, uh, obviously in reference to fake news. Um, so there is this website called thispersondoesnotexist.com, which is a bit cheeky, but you go on it and it generates a face randomly. And some of them are convincing enough that people are now making blog posts about finding out which image is real and which one is not. Right? So here I've highlighted basically this blog post by Karen McDonald, which says, okay, look at the hair. The hair and the teeth are generally where the details are, are the dead giveaways of the of an AI-generated image, right? So if you go on social media now, it's not completely unthinkable that the next Facebook person you click on actually doesn't exist. Um, if you have seen something even freakier, deep video portrait basically enables me to make some facial expressions and then effectively to transfer them onto a, a politician. Uh, I thought I had a picture of Theresa May here, but... Um, She's probably busy with Brexit, so that's going to have to be for another talk. But yeah, if you if you want to Google deep video portraits later on, uh, you'll see that you can actually use Vladimir Putin or Donald Trump as your puppet, and um, yeah, no one really wants that. Still, it exists. The one thing that is really beginning to make this a critical issue is the following. So about a month ago, OpenAI, which is basically the, the AI think tank um, headed by Sam Altman, and uh, boarded by none other than Elon Musk, released a generative model which can generate text at scale. Okay, so the mathematical, I'm not going to go into you know, like the max log likelihood and all the math and good jazz of it. The real idea is very simple. You basically try to predict the next word or the next character, but you train, it on, you train it on such a huge data set, you really leverage the principles of deep learning and big data, and you train it on so much data that it's actually going, going to give you something coherent. It gives you something coherent to such an extent that for the first time, OpenAI did not release the full model. They said, uh, uh, it's too dangerous, we don't want to do that. And it's caused a big stir in the research community, and it's creating a big debate because normally there's not that many people who care about this. And this doesn't happen in 
you know, it's effectively machine learning or statistics research. Like people don't go, oh, this is a dangerous virus, we should not release the code for this. We're talking about, you know, weights that should go on TensorFlow Hub, if anything, right? So why, why did they not release? The idea is that model is basically enough to generate coherent paragraphs. So you seed it with an initial sentence or two, and then it's going to continue basically inventing text ad, ad libitum. So when initialized with the following text, in a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. Like the ideal fake news generation, right? So the model generated many follow-ups, including this one. The scientists named the population after their distinctive horn, Ovis Unicorn. These four horned silver white unicorns were previously unknown to science. Now, after almost two centuries, the mystery of what sparked this odd phenomenon is, odd, is finally solved. Etc., etc., etc. So this thing was actually able to continue that fake story from scratch, right? which is you know, like, what's the end of this? Perez and his friends were astonished to see the unicorn herd. These creatures could be seen from the air without having to move too much to see them. They were so close they could touch their horns. It's poetic, and quite frankly, it's freaky, right? <laughs> so I went and kind of like retrained the model and downloaded the weights and had some fun myself. So I basically had a bit of neural network uh, frenzy a couple of weeks ago, and I seeded the model with um, a piece of news, DeepMind should have been a UK champion, says ex-Google CFO who took it to America. What do we get, right? Google execs Mark Zuckerberg and Sergey Brin, formerly head of the social media giant, have been accused of lying to the US government about the extent of their ties to the Kremlin. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, okay, or like phase, you know, like appearance, perfect. Semantics, eh, not so much. It goes back to what Peter was saying. Um, I was even cheekier, and I took one of my own papers. I took that, like I took that as a seed, and I asked the model to generate some science. Um, and this is what the model generated. So I'm glad to say that as of 2019, I am not being automated anytime soon. It does look like scientific gibberish, though. In fairness, uh, it means absolutely nothing. But it does look like if you wanted to have a joke there, you could basically submit this to a conference and see see if you could catch like you know like maybe an undergrad reviewer or something of course. Cool. So the question I'm going to ask is basically: Are we are we heading towards post-truth economics? Meaning that if we can do these things, uh, and obviously first legislation will be required because if it can be done, it will be done, especially for profits. Um, second is there is a multi-billion dollar industry, which is the content industry. You know, all content industries are potentially touched by this. Uh, obviously, security, cyber security will, will be massively boosted by this, either the blockchain industry or like some kind of watermarking uh, that has not been invented yet. But if the marginal cost of content creation is going to zero, that has implications. Um, and this is another talk altogether. So are we at AGI yet? Peter has treated that. Personally, my view is like AI or deep learning is just basically another way of writing code. It's just the code is actually in the weights, and that's what it is. Um, but yeah, killer co robots are definitely not coming anytime soon. Um, I'm not going to go into the background depth by business stakeholders. I think this is maybe for another talk. I'm just going to leave you with this and, and ask this question. Does this, or like, does any new tech look amazing only because the ethics dimension is neglected? So a lot of what we're doing as human beings is basically doing gradient descent in a mix of the amount of information that we have and the amount of capital that we have. And more often than not, you know, like we can only gain one or the other at any point in time. So we can go to school or we can take a job, but in general, you know, we're not as fulfilled as to being able to take the diagonal. But there is a third dimension, which is ethics, right? And more often than not, you get this great you know, offers in tech right now because the ethics dimension is a bit, you know, under the carpet. So before AGI, and, and I agree it's a pressing issue and we'll definitely have an amazing time with this, I want to present this, which is bioinformatics, which is basically from November 2018, and it's just standard machine learning but on human DNA data. So if you add this with my talk on generative models, you can see where this is going. So I urge you Please think before taking any of these engagements, because again, before AGI, I think bioinformatics and you know, like DNA engineering are going to take off in a massive way. And if you add this with what we've seen, uh, it's all going to be up to you guys.
Thank you very much. Where, where, where can we find you online? What, what's the kind of projects you're involved with quickly? Uh, okay, so basically uh, we have a project that is extending our deep learning lessons. So we effectively wrote a deep learning book which is available online at deeplearningmathematics.com. So basically this is all the equations that did not fit into the slides. So you can go and check that out, deeplearningmathematics.com. Uh, or you can follow me on Twitter at, at CloudStrife is, is my alias. So I can find all my ramblings on the app. Cloud, K-L-O-U-D, Strife. That's right. Thank you very cool. much. Uh, we've got time for one question. Anyone? Is there anyone out there? Oh, yeah, there you go. Just an opinion question. Do you reckon yes. that um, the, uh, open AI can release their weights because of what they released recently about their trying to be more for-profit? Um, yeah, the, okay. The thing is, you know, when I talk about no overlap, I think it's a classic case of no overlap. So uh, I have friends at OpenAI. I don't, you know, I don't want to say anything bad about the, the amount of work that they're doing. But yeah, they basically they have this cap, this notion of cap, and I think they're going to be capped at around a uh, hundred x their initial investment, which for all intents and purposes is a hundred billion dollars. But that's just on profit, right? So a company that would make a hundred billion dollars in profit, we're talking about two trillion dollar valuation. We're talking about three times Amazon or Apple. So yeah, I've, I've got a bit of a financial background. I know these things, but yeah, if you put your cap at three times Amazon, you're not capped. You become a full profit. So I hope that answers your question. Solid. Okay, cool. We're running out of time there. Um, Pierre, Canapan, and Peter, thanks very much, guys. It's really good to see you all. Big love, and we'll see you in the next one. So round of applause for everybody. Thank you.